a small boy, said, Father's Day is just like Mother's Day, only you don't have to spend as much on the gift. <laughs> to which the father says, what gift? <laughs> Mark Twain said, my mic's a little hot, because I had, I had forgot to turn it on earlier, and so you probably tried to boost it. <laughs> Mark Twain said, when I was a boy of 14, my father was so ignorant, I could hardly stand to be in the room with the old man. But when I got to 21, I was astonished at how much he'd learned in seven years. <laughs> I, I myself called my dad when I was about, I don't know, 40, and said, Dad, I'm sorry. And he said, for what? I said, everything. Because <laughs> by that point, I was a parent. <laughs> Someone wrote these humorous words entitled, A World According to Dad. These are words that dads have spoken to their children at one time or another. This is going to hurt me more than it's going to hurt you. <laughs> um, oh, this one my father said a lot. Don't forget to check the oil. <laughs> How should I know? Ask your mother. I'm not made out of money. When I was your age, I walked five miles to and from school each little, and it was uphill both ways. You are going, and you will have fun. <laughs> Who's paying the bills around here anyway? Right. Don't put your feet on the furniture. Your mother will kill you. Get down here before you kill yourself. Ah, go ahead. <laughs> Quit playing with your food. Be quiet. Can't you see I'm trying to think here? Why? Because I said so. If you don't quit that, I'm going to call your mother. You better get that junk picked up before your mother comes in here. Oh. My favorite. Just wait till you have kids of your own. Um, I suppose there are fathers here who could add more to that list. Being a parent and a father can be an interesting and trying experience. And I'm sure he can tell you a lot of the experiences with me were trying. Because I was an arrogant young man. She's just shaking her head. <laughs> um, someone once said, parents spend the first part of a child's life urging them to talk and to walk and the rest of the childhood telling them to sit down and be quiet. <laughs> a letter from a college student says, please send food packages. All they serve here is breakfast, lunch, and dinner. <laughs> And another son wrote home to his dad and said, Dear Dad, please let me hear from you more often, even if it's only five or ten. <laughs> I, I, I know if I happen to have money in my wallet, which isn't very often that I have actual cash in my wallet, but if I do, Kristen knows exactly how much is there, and that's how much she needs for school that week. <laughs> I don't know how that works. Um, but parenting is not really going to be the thrust of my sermon this morning. Um, I don't want to talk about earthly fathers. I want to talk about a heavenly parent who gives us grace. So I want you to hear these words from the Apostle Paul in his letter to the church to Rome. First, it's going to be from the message. By entering through faith into what God has always wanted to do for us, set us right with him. Make us fit for him. We have it all together with God because of our master Jesus. And that's not all. We throw open our doors to God and discover at the same moment that he has already thrown open his door to us. We find ourselves standing where we always hoped we might stand, out in the wide open spaces of God's grace and glory, standing tall and shouting our praise. There's more to come. We continue to shout our praise even when we're hemmed in with our troubles. 
because we know how troubles can develop passionate patience in us and how that patience in turn forges the tempered steel of virtue keeping us alert for whatever God will do next in alert expectancy such as this we're never left feeling shortchanged quite the contrary we can't round up enough containers to hold everything God generously pours into our lives through the Holy Spirit. The word of the Lord for the people of God. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, for you are our rock and you are our redeemer. Amen. In the first four chapters of Romans, the Apostle Paul explains how we come into a right relationship with God. And the good news is that God is that we can come into a right relationship by this grace that God provides through faith in Jesus. It's called justification by faith. And if you've ever studied uh, Martin Luther, he says it over and over and over. I took a class um, on Luther in seminary. Actually, it was uh, on the Reformation, but we spent a good deal of time on Luther in the Reformation. And if you understood Martin Luther, you got a glimpse into the Book of Romans because that's where Luther spent his time. Now, as chapter 5 begins, Paul writes about the blessings of this justification. Having explained how we receive justification, he explains what this justification gives us. Now, we're going to reread this in the NRSV in just a second. Would you go ahead and put up that first slide? See the first word there? Therefore. A pastor friend of mine, the name of John Garner, once told me, he said, when you see the word therefore, you need to pay attention to what's coming next. Because that's what Paul has meant. So he spent the first four chapters telling you stuff, and now he's ready for you to really hear what he wanted to say. Therefore, so keeping that in mind, listen to these words. Therefore, since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand, and we boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God. And not only that, but we also boast in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not disappoint us, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. Before we go too far, we need to pause and think about this word, justified. And other places in the Bible, the same word is translated as righteousness. It's the righteousness that we hear about in the Old Testament. So when a person fulfills his or her end of a relationship or his or her obligations, they are said to be righteous. Righteousness entails faithfulness to a relationship. And Paul has laid out for the church in Rome, and for us, in the first four chapters, that you and I, while created to be in relationship with God, have fallen short on our end of the bargain. Because we sin. We do things that separate us from God. And we don't keep up our end of the relationship, so we've fallen short of the glory of God. But here's the good news he offers in chapter 5. God repairs it. Love changes everything. Think with me for a moment about a relationship in your life that is strained or has been. Almost all of us have had those relationships in our lives. Maybe it's a spouse, maybe it's a child, maybe it's a parent. Maybe it's somebody at work, maybe it's somebody sitting in the pew or chair across the room. But you know how difficult it is to forgive that person if they've hurt you. And you know how difficult it is to ask to be forgiven if you're the one who's done the damage. 
So the question is, how often are we even willing to give when the other person is the one in the wrong and lay ourselves on the line to set that relationship up to be repaired? It's hard. It's difficult for me, but it's what God does for us. God repairs the relationship with us. Jesus came to teach us how to live the right life. Jesus came and was willing to sacrifice himself. Not that the sacrifice is what makes us right with God, but that he was willing to die for his friends. God chose to take the initiative. God so loved the world and that love changed everything. So that's why we're here this morning, because of a great love. The love which Paul says we continue on because of gifts from the Holy Spirit. We have a future in heaven, as people often talk about. But it's not just about a heavenly future. The love was poured out for us, gives us something to look forward to, but it also gives us a hope to carry on here and now. Gives us the courage to face those issues in our lives. In verse 3, Paul says, not only does this love give us reason to boast about eternity, but it gives us reasons to, reason to boast in our sufferings. So Paul was a little crazy. Rejoice in our problems and our trials. How many of us really like to do that? <laughs> Contrary to those who proclaim an unbalanced theology of health, wealth, and, par and prosperity. The Bible does not tell us to expect to run into problems. The Bible does tell us that we're going to run into problems and trials and tribulations. It not only tells us to expect them in the Christian walk, but it goes further to tell us that God actually allows them and uses them to develop us being Christ-like. I mean, would we say that the Apostle Paul lacked faith because he did not exercise his authority in Christ and overcome all the obstacles in his life? This teaching gets promoted, this health, wealth, and prosperity. And Paul said, boast in your sufferings. Paul is telling us that our trials can work for us and not against us. But only we determine the course. We often have a natural tendency to ask the question, why, when we run into hardship. And it's no problem with asking why. We, I mean, that's just normal. You know, when we see tornadoes take out towns, when we see family members dealing with life-threatening illnesses. But we have to move beyond the question of why to a place of hope, to a place of trust in God, and then God is developing character in us through the trials. That's the only way we make it through when difficulties seem homeless, hopeless. How many times have we wanted to escape something rather than live through it? But knowing that we lived through it, it made us a better person. That's what Paul's talking about. Endurance produces character. It makes us better people, and as our character improves, so does our ability to have hope, to see the hand of God at work in the fiery furnaces of our life. I think hell is also not something that happens off in the distance. And I think people go through hell now.
but hope allows us to come out uncharred. The hope that endures our sufferings ultimately produces love poured out by the Holy Spirit into our lives. Peter mentions in 1 Peter uh, that the very fact of the suffering Christians in Pontus and Galatia and Cappadocia and Asia and I can't even pronounce that one, Bithynia, a group of churches are undergoing severe persecution when Nero, the emperor of Rome, was killing the Christians. But faith produces hope. Jack Kelly, who's a reporter for USA Today, tells a story uh, that he went to uh, on a trip to East Africa. He said he was in uh, Mogadishu, uh, capital of Somalia, to cover a famine. And it was so bad that as he walked toward the village, he saw people on the ground just dead, lying around. And he says he recalls the smell of death in the air. That it's something that gets into your hair and onto your skin and onto your clothes and it can't be washed off. As, his mate, as he made his way down the road, he came across a little boy and he could tell that the boy had worms and was malnourished and his stomach was protruding. His hair had turned a reddish color and his skin had wrinkled as if he were 100 years old. The photographer who was traveling with the reporter had a grapefruit and he gave it to the boy. But the boy was so weak, he couldn't hold the grapefruit up for himself. And so they cut the grapefruit in half and they gave it to him and he took the grapefruit and he looked up at the two men as if to say thank you and he began to walk back towards the village. And when what the little boy didn't realize is as he was walking back Towards the village, the little boy didn't realize that they were following him at a distance. As he entered the village, there was a, a little boy who looked almost dead, and his eyes were completely glazed over, and as it turned out, this was the younger brother. The elder brother kneeled down next to the younger brother, bit off a piece of the grapefruit, and chewed it up and opened his younger brother's mouth, put the grapefruit in, and worked his brother's jaws up and down. A couple days later, the reporter and the photographer learned that the older, older brother had died of malnutrition. But his younger brother lived because he was giving him the food. You have to wonder if that's what Jesus meant when he said there's no greater love than to lay down your life for somebody else. Love changes everything. It changes our hearts and causes us to do things for others that we would never have done before. We are justified by faith. Saved by grace. But that faith and grace changes us. We must not, we have to take that and do something with it. If God did that for us, then we have to do something with that. Serve others. We have to do things because we are loved that much. I, I, I follow a thing on uh, Facebook called Coffee with Jesus. I had, somebody bought me one of the books of Coffee with Jesus. And there's a few of these. Can you go to that screen? I might have to get out there to read them because I didn't print these off. Am I in the way if I'm standing here? Jesus, please don't let me waste this day. Don't waste this day, Lisa. Wait, you can't do that. Now the pressure's on me. Just taking off the training wheels, Lisa. I'll jog along in case you need the help. 
Okay, the next one. The preachers say you can't do anything. Jesus did it all. Then they say you have to do A, B, C, or you can't do X, Y, Z. If you died tomorrow, Carl, where do you think you'd stand with me? Well, you'd let me into paradise. I'm saved by grace through faith. Aren't I? Yes, Carl. Now, actually live like it. My life feels like a roller coaster, Jesus. It's up and down, wild turns, climbing slowly or plummeting rapidly. It's frightening. You know how they lower that steel bar when you get into the roller coaster, Lisa? That thing you grip that keeps you secure? Yeah, sure. I'm the steel bar. I don't always agree with these theologically, but I love them. There, I'm going to read you a couple more from the book. If I can figure it out. Um, This one's called face print. There were two sets of footprints in the sand, and every once in a while there'd be one face print. And Jesus says, and the remainders of the campfire where I stopped to grill you some fish before we set off on our path again. So what's the deal, Jesus? Weren't you supposed to carry me like the poem says? Jesus says, it's a nice poem. But sometimes what you need is a nice, solid face plant before we can get up and start walking again. <laughs> or this one. The young men need to see a, a tough Jesus, a sword-wielding, muscle-bound, long-haired, take-no-prisoners, action hero, badass Jesus. And Jesus says, people always want to remake me. Not that long ago, I was painted as a Southern California surfer with blue contact lenses. <laughs> and the person says, well, how about we emphasize the carpentry aspect of, your, of you more? Maybe you could, your gimmick could be you had a huge hammer, or better yet, a saw. And Jesus says, wait a minute. I've got it. What if my superhero was, oh, this is good, love and forgiveness? That would be so radical. You think you can work with that? And then this one I just love because of, I like music. Where'd it go? There we go. Jesus, who's your favorite Christian singer? And Jesus said, one of my favorites is a woman from a small village in northern Thailand. She sings her heart out all day while she's working in the fields. Oh, so no one anyone's ever heard of. Well, she won't be touring the church circuit anytime soon, if that's what you're saying, but she's famous where I come from. <laughs> How are we making a difference? In a small cemetery, in a parish courtyard, in Olney, England, stands a granite tombstone with the following inscription. John Newton, clerk, once an infidel and libertine, servant of slavers in Africa, was by the rich mercy of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, preserved, restored, pardoned, and appointed to preach the faith he had long labored to destroy. Anybody know who John Newton is? You would. Mm -hmm. you tell me who it was. No, not Isaac Newton. John Newton wrote Amazing Grace. Oh. And it was amazing. He had followed his father to see and he had a pile, he lived a life filled with rebellion and debauchery, a life that gave him his own ship, which was a slave ship, that trafficked in the capturing and selling and transporting of black slaves from, to the plantations in the West Indies and America. He trafficked in human suffering and degradation. 
But on March 10th, 1748, somehow God got a hold of John Newton. He was confronted with the power of a God during a storm at sea. And the wonders of God in a book called The Imitation of Christ. And he said, he cried out, I am undone. And then he said he was remade in Christ. He left the slave trade, became a clerk, and then studied and became an Anglican priest. <coughs> and by the end of his life, he fought for the abolition of slavery. In 1807, the year of Newton's death, the British Parliament fulfilled his hopes and abolished slavery throughout all of its domain. John Newton never ceased to marvel at the mercy and grace of God that had so dramatically changed his life. It's a dominant theme in his preaching and his writing, and what he had to say was, Amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. We sing those words like they've been around all along, but knowing that the man who wrote them truly believed and was a wretch of a man. But God was able to take him and use him to make changes in the world. What changes are we going to make because of God's grace that has been given to us? Amen.